Good and thank you for coming this humid afternoon to listen to this presentation. As Professor Edenir uh, said, me uh, un nombre, 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 es Luis Rodriguez, and I come from. I'm originally from Peru, so we're neighbors, but. I went to the United States to, to, to pursue my master in 1991. And then I was there only for the masters. That was my idea. But then things really work out. I really enjoy doing research. I stayed there for my uh, PhD. And after I finished my PhD, I had a great opportunity to go to the FDA. I was with the FDA. Uh, for four years, and at the FDA, I learned about this technology, which is vibrational spectroscopy, that I'm going to talk a little bit about in this seminar. But before uh, we start, I'm going to, to briefly go through my university, Ohio State University. Um, I found some um, pictures. Uh, our university was fund, founded in 1870 is one of the universities that are called land-grant university. So each state in the, in, in the US has a land-grant university. And we part of our mission is agricultural. So I'm in the Department of Food Science and Technology uh, at the Ohio State University. And we make a lot of jokes about the because there's other OSU. There's Oklahoma State, where I did my master and PhD, Oregon State. But there's only one, the OSU, which is Ohio State. And this is our department. Uh, we have uh, several faculty. Ohio State is not like Ufiscar, that is outside the town. We're right in the middle of Columbus. And so we are in, in the city, and we have the suburbs usually um, on the outside. This is our mascot. It's called Brutus, and he's a gnat. He might be a little gnat. He's a gnat, and actually it's a toxic gnat, but we're very fond of Brutus. So that's our mascot. We have a huge stadium. It's called the Horseshoe. It has a capacity for 120,000 people to attend the football games. Now, it's not soccer. It's football, American football. And every game that our football team plays, we have a completely sold out stadium. Not one seat available. So there's, there's a lot of tradition there. Uh, really nice uh, uh, campus that we have. Uh, this is our building. It's called Parker. Uh, and it's called Parker because the Parker family donated money to build this. They, they did the largest contribution. Um, there's a story with Parker building. Um, do you know the drumsticks? How many of you have the, how do you call drumsticks ice cream? The ones that have the cone? Uh, and then you have the ice cream inside? Cascal. Huh? Cascal. OK. Uh, the idea actually originated from uh, some faculty that worked in our department. And they had the idea to cover with chocolate the interior of the cone. Because if you don't have that chocolate, it gets soggy. It, it, becomes, uh, it picks up water. So they cover that with chocolate. And that way, they impeded the migration of water into the waffle cone. That was patented by the Parker family. They sold the idea to Nestle. And so they make a lot of money. And because they made a lot of money, they made a really nice contribution to our building. Um, we are a multidisciplinary. We do a lot of research in applied science um, in many different disciplines. And I'm going to go through some of the disciplines. Um, we have faculty, oops, too much. 
We have faculty in food chemistry, processing and engineering, microbiology, packaging, and sensory science. Uh, faculty usually is going to have different roles in these areas. So we're going to have multidisciplinary uh, research topics. Um, so the major fields in, of research in our department is phytonutrients and health. We're doing uh, food analysis, physical properties, uh, flavor and dairy functionality, electrostatic coating, food safety, novel processing technologies like ozone, PEF, high pressure. Uh, we are um, cutting edge in those technologies. Um, we have faculty doing a lot of work on biofilms, antibiotic resistance, and food viruses. Um, so we have uh, a, a really broad um, faculty with many different experiences or expertises. Um, we are um, a university that puts our students first. And this is something that I really like in our university because we have a lot of opportunities for our students. Um, our students participate in many product development competitions. They travel a lot to many different places to present their products. And these are some examples. This product that was developed uh, placed first at the, the largest conference in the United States associated with food and food science. Do you know which one is? The IFT, have you heard of IFT? Well, IFT is the largest conference and we have each year a meeting in many different places and we have about 20 to 25,000 attendees from all over the world. Actually, a lot of participants from Brazil, but from Campinas, they, they present a lot of their, pro, uh, of their research in, at the IFT. So uh, this is another one that we had last year. It's called the Unbeatable Burger. And it's unbeatable because it makes, it's made of beet. What is beet in? Beterraga, Beterraga, that one. So um, we, we have one of the largest undergraduate programs in the US. We currently have 200 students in our undergrad program, and we have about 70 grad students uh, in, in the masters and PhD. So we're one of the largest in the US. Um, if you want any additional information, uh, just let me know. I can provide information about the university. If you're interested in going as a visiting scholar, or if you're interested in doing a, a PhD or master's, let me know. Um, so this is the topic of my presentation. Okay, I'm going to my field of research is um, infrared. Vibrational spectroscopy, which with more emphasis in mid infrared and near infrared spectroscopies. Um, the, the infrared is going to be um, a portion of the electromagnetic radiation. Now, the, one of the characteristics of this region is that we're not going to be uh, using high energy. So usually we're going to be looking at these levels. Near infrared always uses a higher energy. We have mid infrared and we have far infrared. Uh, the energy that interacts with our molecules is not enough to um, result in electronic transitions, but what we're going to do is uh, lead or, or have molecular vibrations. So what we're going to be looking is at my uh, molecular vibrations of molecules. And these are the type, you know, I like to say that we have our molecules doing a workout, okay? We give them energy and a specific uh, frequency and they're going to do a workout, okay? 
Once they rest, they go back to the ground state. Okay? So we, we're going to look at symmetric or asymmetric stretching. And between the, the, the bending, we're going to look at scissoring, rocking, twisting, and winding. And we know exactly at which frequency different molecules are going to have these types of vibrations. So we can identify, based on the signal, what are the types of functional groups that we have. Um, I know that, and I have been impressed with the NMR facilities here in Sao Carlos. I have never seen so many NMRs in one place as here when I visited the lab. And I have never seen four in just one space in the lab. So, but before we had NMR, high resolution NMR, chemists used mid infrared to characterize their compounds. So there's a lot of information available about specific vibrations of different functional groups in many different uh, matrices. So we use that as a fingerprint, okay? Different molecules are going to have different vibrations that we can identify and fingerprint. So this is one, actually one portion, this portion of the mid infrared is called the fingerprint region. So we can use it to characterize products. One of the advancements in the technology that has really made a big impact in vibrational spectroscopy, especially in the mid infrared region, has been attenuated total reflectance, or ATR. The, what happens with this is we have crystals. And there's not that many crystals. We have about a handful of crystals that are going to have a physical property. Once they, are, they interact with our infrared radiation, they're going to allow some of the energy to escape. We call it they form an evanescence wave. So because it escapes, the energy that escapes is at a fixed path length. It's always going to be the same amount of energy that is interacting with your sample. So what is going to happen is now we're going independent of path length. The path length is created by the crystal. And depending on the different crystal that you use, you're going to have path length between eight, usually seven to 10 microns. So you're talking about micron contact with your sample. If you have your sample in close con contact with your crystal at this path length, you're going to have a good signal. So you can put milligrams of sample. If you can make it, you can put a kilogram of your sample you're going to have the same spectra as long as you have that path length being in contact with your sample. So now, by using this technology, we are path length free, which is one of the major issues that we had with infrared. Uh, how many of you have done some infrared uh, experiments? Uh, how many of you have used the KBR pellets? It, this technology basically eliminated. KBR pellets is now past technology. We don't need it because now ATR is giving us the, the path length to work. Now, even better, the technology has evolved. This is um, a single, um, actually here we have two contacts with our sample. We, have, we can have multiple reflections. So we can have multiple bounces of our signal in the ATR. For each bounce that we have additional, we're increasing one-fold, two-fold, three-fold our signal. So if we have a triple bounce, in theory, we can have triple the intensity of our bands. So now we can get improved sensitivity, better detection, improving signal to noise ratio. So right now, companies are doing 
this type of crystals, there's a company that has a 20 bounce ATR accessory that we can use to increase the resolution. Uh, now triple bounds, five bounds, nine bounds are very um, easy or accessible for doing a lot of research. So this is the major technology that we're using in mean infrared spectroscopy. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Raman. Um, NILAB, we're not working with Raman. Uh, I'm trying to get some funding to work with Raman, but uh, most of my research is focused on mean infrared and mean infrared. But Raman is a, another spectroscopy tool that we have. And it's a different type of, fundament, of fundamental vibration. Because with Raman, what we're looking is at scattering. So what we have is a laser that is going to have a fixed um, frequency. And that laser, what it's going to do is, is going to produce scattering. We have two different types of scattering, the Rayleigh and the Raman. Rayleigh scattering is going to be at the same intensity, at the same frequency as our laser. So we can use a filter and, ex and exclude Rayleigh um, the, the Rayleigh effect or the Rayleigh scattering. Now, the Rayleigh scattering can be at the same or multiple. So you have to be careful because you're going to see another Rayleigh uh, scattering at the frequency times two, times three, but the intensity is much lower, okay? So what we're going to have with Raman scattering is we're, the, the molecules are going to make that scattering of the light at different frequencies. And those frequencies matches the fundamental vibrations of the molecules. So this Raman shift that we obtain is going to be the same as frequencies we obtain with fundamental vibrations in the mean infrared. It's a different phenomenon because with the mean infrared, what we have is excitation of molecules, molecules vibrating. Here, we're resulting in scattering, which is giving us the Raman signal. So what we're going to have, one of the, you know, nothing is perfect in this world. One of the caveats with Raman is fluorescence, okay? So we have to, um, with the lower wavelength of lasers, we have higher signal. 